truly a pleasure to be with you this morning. Good morning, everyone. So how many people are familiar with Grayston? So not a lot. I love it. So yesterday, Bert Jacobs told us that it's the t-shirt that is used to connect people. It's a tool for connecting people. Well, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think about how a blondie and a brownie could change someone's life dramatically, seriously change their life. So change the whole trajectory of a single mom, a, someone who's a re-entry person, uh, someone who has English as a second language, never in, in a million years did I think that this simple product could do that. But what if I told you that each of you in this room, your product, your service, could do the exact same thing? So that's what I want to talk about today and show you the how we can bring people off the fringes back into the workforce through what we call open hiring or inclusive hiring. So we are located in Southwest Yonkers, New York, about 200,000 people. 15% of the population lives below the poverty line. So since we're conscious capitalists, uh, let's be intentional about the use of terms here. Poverty line is very academic. So let me just contextualize it for you. The federal poverty rate, it's kind of a joke, but go with me here, for a single person is about $13,000 a year. So it's about $250 a month, a week. Family of four, it's about $26,000, so $500 a week. Do a little exercise for me. How would you live if you only had $250 to $500 a week to spend? How would you live? We were just talking outside where, you know, we could drop that over lunch. The people in Southwest Yonkers, about 30,000 of them, live below that. Let me do the visual. They live below that. Those are the people we serve every day. Those are the people we employ. They're living below the poverty line. It is unconscionable to think about that, but it's true, and it happens every day in Southwest Yonkers. This is our founder, right there, Bernie Glassman. Instructions to the Cook is a book he wrote uh, a long time ago. Um, it's a book that I give out to all of our new employees so that they get a sense of the DNA of Grayston. Uh, Bernie Glassman is his name, and Bernie is an unusual person, uh, was an unusual person. He passed away in 2018. Jewish guy from Brooklyn, aeronautical engineer, Zen Buddhist monk, becomes social entrepreneur, makes perfect sense he would create a company that makes brownies and inclusions. But he started out with this idea, this belief, fundamental belief that is still alive and well today. And he believed that we are all these amazing ingredients of a meal. You, 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 amazing ingredients. You all have something to contribute to society, to an organization. You have this talent, you have this gift that we all need. And to the extent we don't use it, we lose. We lose every day if I'm not using your talent, I'm not using your gift. And he looked at, going back to that poverty number, he looked at the area that they were in. And this is actually a picture of the Zen Buddhist community that he was with uh, in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. At the time, they were supporting themselves by baking cakes. And Bernie would literally, literally see some of the folks on the streets who were looking for work and would pull them off the street and just say, hey, do you want to learn a skill? Do you want to learn something that you could put on your resume and you could use later in life to improve your employment trajectory? He would literally pull people off the street to do that because he saw it as a great injustice that we have people on our streets that want to work. They have the ability to work, but for whatever reason, they have been blocked from employment because they're a returning citizen they're homeless, they lack experience. As one of my employees says, I'm not male. <laughs> they have some type of barrier to employment and Bernie felt that that is an injustice. I wanna contextualize that for you a little bit more as we look at the current landscape that we're in now. And you know, James, if you're a suppressed creative in music, I'm a suppressed labor economist, so just, just help me. <laughs> 
Help me with the, with the math here. <laughs> We've got 11 million unfilled jobs in this country. Eight to nine million unemployed, officially. Then we got another 10 million on the sidelines that have just left the labor force because they have one or more barriers to employment. Is there something wrong with this when we've got 20 million people? Do not tell me that there is a labor shortage when we have nearly 20 million people not working and want to work and 11 million unfilled jobs. That is a problem. Something needs to change. Bernie sought to do that. This is an amazing story. So Bernie went on a uh, conference in Colorado, I believe. It was a social venture conference. And he met two hippies. One guy was Ben Cohen. The other guy was Jerry Greenfield, Ben and Jerry's. They were trying to figure out how they could work together, because at the time, you know, Grayston was making cakes and things like that. So they came up with the idea that they would make these whoopie pies, so the vanilla ice cream with the you know, chocolate cookie on top. Bernie invested everything he had into doing this. Uh, we shipped the product. We, I wasn't there yet. It was 1982. I was nine. But they sh <laughs> he shipped the product to Vermont. And it didn't survive the shipping process. So instead of these nice cookies that were separated, it was just this big slab of chocolate stuff that they could not use until some guy said, why don't we put it in chocolate ice cream? Chocolate fudge brownie was born. So today we probably produce just over 50,000 pounds of brownies every day. So we're the part of the global supply chain for Ben and Jerry's Unilever. So we're making chocolate fudge brownie, half-baked, my personal favorite. Uh, Netflix and chilled. We just came out with a new flavor called Changes Brewing with a black-owned company, uh, Black and Bold. It's a coffee company. It's a great flavor, so you have to try it. But we also produce brownies for Whole Foods, so Kava, and other retailers. This is our latest flavor, pumpkin and spice brownie. You have, blondie, you have to try it. It's very good as well. I don't show you these slides to get you hungry and to get you to buy brownies. All right, I do. I want you to buy the brownies. <laughs> Grayston.org. But I show you this because what these brownies are doing is that they are a tool that we use to help eliminate employment barriers. This is an interesting graphic that we have up here. I deliberately made the ladder short so that you cannot get over the top. Because a lot of the people we employ, a lot of the people that we serve through our foundation, they're not trying to climb the career ladder. Many of them don't even know it exists. They're trying to find it. And it's because they all have these different types of barriers to employment. And this is not an exhaustive list. Like I said, returning citizen, homeless, language, there's all these different things that are keeping people out of the labor force. We have a solution to Bernie's question. How do you create a thriving community, flourishing community? How do you get people off the sidelines? And it's called open hiring. It is simple, but it is radically different than anything that any HR professional would ever use. Uh, if you really want to tick me off, tell me this is how we've always done it. <laughs> this is not how. You're going to do it. <laughs> this is totally different. Open hiring is simply that. It is open. We have a, what we call an employment list where folks will put their name on a list to be a bakery apprentice. And when the next job becomes available, it's yours. No background checks. We don't do interviews. We don't even want your resume. Only requirement is that you have resolved that you want to be successful. You resolve you want to work. You resolve you want to learn something, and you want to take your life, your career, whatever it might be, to the next level. And this is something that we've been doing for nearly 40 years. And next year is going to be a big year for us. We will be turning 40. It will also be our 10-year anniversary as a B Corporation. Uh, so we have the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. So it's a big year for us. But it's also a big year because we don't want to be the only ones doing this. Go back to the 11 million unfilled jobs and the 20 million on the sidelines. At any given time, I can only employ like 70 open hires. 
But what if everybody in this room and the people you know, the contacts that you have, are taking one job, 10 jobs, 1,000 jobs, whatever it might be, and giving those opportunities to people? This, and I love what was said before, this is not corporate social responsibility. It's not a welfare to work program. This is an opportunity, not a promise. And it's a human capital strategy. It's a business model. It's a strategy to get good people into your organization, people ready, willing, and able to work. Now is the time. If anything that we have learned over these last two years, there's just been so much that is just this confluence of events that have just got us to this point where we don't have a choice other than to be bold. Business Roundtable has embraced stakeholder capitalism. You've got people like Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan Chase, Anjay Baga, MasterCard talking about inclusive economy and stakeholder capitalism. Jamie Dimon wrote this amazing uh, op-ed, New York Times, talking about how we need to embrace second chance hiring. Everybody's talking about the what. Yes, we need to hire those folks, but it's the how that we really have to learn. And Grayston is willing to teach every person in this room how to do it so that you and your organization can implement this wherever you live, Philadelphia, Chicago. We have a hub in Rochester, New York City, LA, Dallas. Think what would happen if we, in, in our 20, 2030 vision, is to have 40,000 jobs be available through open or inclusive hiring. If we did that, $3 billion of impact for this country. Think about that. $3 billion of impact. We have partners now, whether it's the Body Shop, and I'm sure you're familiar with their products, Rhino Foods, you may not be familiar with them, but they make the cookie dough that goes into the Ben & Jerry's ice cream. They have about 60% of the cookie dough market. Uh, you'll hear from my board member, Ty Hookway, in a second, who's a practitioner of open hiring. And over the past year, just over 1,000 opportunities have been provided. So we're slowly getting to our goal for 2030. But here's the business case. You know, I want to talk, I love numbers, I love data, so here's the business case. Our partners, particularly the Body Shop, they cut their turnover rate by almost two-thirds by embracing open hiring. They started in their distribution center, then they rolled it out to their retail operations in the US and Canada. Their productivity went up 13% at their distribution center, if you look at it from a unit per hour basis. Another partner of ours, grocery store chain in Pittsburgh, Giant Eagle. They cut their time to hire from 30 days to five to seven. From a business perspective, from a business case perspective, that is incredible because you are now taking resources that we once used to keep people out and now reallocated them to keep folks, to bring them in, but then to keep them in. That is what inclusive hiring, inclusive employment is all about. How do we tear down the barriers? Bring folks in, but keep them in, nurture them as employees, have them have a career path within the organization and move them along. And at Grayston, I actually don't care if you move up or you move out, because if we start with the proposition that if it weren't for a grace and you wouldn't even have a job, I'm happy when you leave, because that's great, because now you have opportunities and you have choices that you didn't have before. So I'm going to show you, I'm not play the video yet, but I'm going to show you some stories, because I think the best ambassadors for Grayston are the folks that work with us. And you will hear three stories of a single mom, You'll hear a story of a returning citizen, and you'll hear a story of a woman who was, uh, had English as a second language. But it is their stories that makes all of us want to come to work. And I have to give credit to some students from Westchester County Community College who put this 20-minute documentary together. You're just going to see the trailer. Next year, we'll be, we'll be releasing it to the public. But you'll get to hear their stories. So cue it up, and I'll be right back. because I didn't have that experience or because I wasn't a male or because I you know, didn't have the education or there was so different factors that, that they just looked at me and was like, no. And they didn't give me that chance. And I, I get it, you know, but all I needed was a chance. 
So I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I just kept getting no. No, 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 no. So it was hard. Hi, Shauna. This is Melissa calling from Grayston Bakery. Please be here at 930 with two forms of ID. Congratulations. Welcome to Grayston. We focus on the future. We don't focus on the past. How do we give people hope? It's just been up, you know? They told me yes when everyone else said no. And it means everything. I'm just a whole host of folks, about 10 million actually across this country, who have some type of employment barrier. Starting my lifestyle over from the negative to the positive. We have this amazing open hiring model that I can tell you is quite revolutionary. This idea of just having someone put their name on a list. Grayston means everything. I'm stable. I, there's no question mark for tomorrow. I know that I have a job. I know that my bills are going to be paid. I know that my children are fed. It's a family because we're looking out for each other. They want to be part of this team. I felt like I had good life. I was able to provide for my family. So my, my, my normal mantra is buy, donate, replicate but I, I really want to start with replication to see that the open hiring and inclusive model is replicated in so many different contexts across this country uh, to get back those 10 million people into the workforce and out of the fringes. So many more stories like Shauna, who you heard from, Alvin, who spoke, Maria, can be written and it could start in this room right now. I want to give you some context to Shauna, just to really, so you can understand the context. She's been with us for about three years now. She started out as an apprentice. What you didn't hear is that she was turned down so many times that she was at the point, and she's a single mom of five kids, where she was going to give up her five children. It was on the day that she was going to make that decision, she got the call from Grayston. She's been with us now for three years. She's one of our lead operators, and she's with all our kids. That is the power of Open Heart. So my challenge to this group is to join us on this journey so that we can write more stories of these. We've got 40,000 we've got to write if we want to get to that $3 billion figure of impact. And we could do it. The one lever that we all control as founders, CEOs, business leaders, it is the power to hire. We don't seek congressional approval for that, state legislator approval for that. We can do whatever we want. You could do it today, and we'd love to show you how. So please join us on this journey, and let's take open hiring and inclusive hiring to the next level. Thank you. God bless. I'm going to ask Ty and Javon to come on stage. Let's be diverse. We got a black gentleman, a white gentleman, and I'm half white, half black, so let's get diversity. <laughs> go ahead, Eddie. Let's go ahead and do, do our part. So, I mean, we're, we're going to dive right in. I, I once read something that said, be the change that you want to see in the world. I believe it was Gandhi that said that. I mean, you all are the definition of living out the change you, you want to see in the world. That said, what are some of the, you, you put the, the ladder up there, or the wall of bricks. Mm -hmm. what are, go, go more into detail. What are some of the things that we are unaware of, or the, the challenges people face when they're trying to get hired? Yeah, so, I mean, that wall of bricks, those were the characteristics. So, you know, the returning citizen, the homeless person, the single parent. But... The problem is, and let's just call it a problem, is you know, as 
business leaders, as hiring managers, as leaders in our organizations, we have biases. Let's be frank about that. I have my own. So when I see someone come into my office that has a name, Javon, or I know that someone who's applying for a position that has a record, we don't even know what the person did, but it's a record, I have already made decisions about who you are and what you're capable of. And nine times out of 10, you're wrong. Because I've told you already that you know, the folks that are hired through these, they have all of those characteristics. And we as business leaders, and HR professionals as well, and we have those biases. Uh, and they prevent folks from entering the workforce. And that is the challenge that we have to address. Like, how do we have a mind shift in terms of going back to my pet peeve, stop doing it the way we've always done it? Clearly, it's not working. So how do we do something different to bring folks into the organization? And it's about changing our mindset, changing how we view folks. If you are a returning citizen, do I really care? I need you to mix flour and sugar and cocoa. What does that have to do with your past? Can you do this job? And the challenge is seeing beyond that barrier and looking at what they're actually capable of is what we really need to address. So, so I saw up there you, you put, um, I may be inserting one of my own, no, no resumes, yeah. no background checks, what, you, you gotta go into that one, because everyone here, we all know we check <laughs> resumes. We, you know, I, I gotta see the resume. What, what's the resume look like? Talk on that one. It, it really is, it's simple. I mean, you saw a clip in, in the trailer there. It's a one pager um, that you have to, now we're gonna have a QR code so you can actually do it on, on your phone. But right now, you, can, you go to our facility on 104 Alexander Street in Yonkers, you put your name on the list, you know, your phone number, email, and you know, on average, it's about six months because the list could be as high as 100 or 200 folks. But that is it. And you get the call, say in six months, saying, hey, Javon, your name was on the list. Are you still available? You report for orientation. That's your first day on the job. That's your first day at access to benefits, the union. And you begin a six to nine month apprenticeship. And the rest is hopefully a good history. So, so I'm going to point something out here. We're all judgmental when it comes to resumes. We see a resume, we look at the credentials, where they went to school, where they work. So I'm going to put two resumes in front of you. I need you all to be honest in this room. First resume. Person has been the president of a software company that's been scaled to $100 million valuation. Then they've been the CEO of a media company that's a $50 million media company. How many people would interview that person? Tell the truth. Okay. Second resume. Person can only read on a fifth and sixth grade level. Person has a GED, no college degree, and dad was a, a pimp and drug dealer. Who's going to interview that person? Come on, be honest. Who's interviewing? I saw two hands. I'm the same person. That person did both those things. That's me. Why I share that is because a lot of people have a lot of great resumes. You know who had a great resume? Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> the gentlemen that were running Enron had wonderful resumes. People need a chance. And here's what's interesting. He talked about it when, when he made the introduction. So our company, we're, we're, we'll be over 100 people by the, the end of this year, if not already. And I interview, I sit with every person that we hire into the organization. I've never once looked at someone's resume that works with us, not one. I've had people in the interview say, well, did you look at my resume? Nope. I'm here to talk to you about your character. Because for us, we can teach skill set. What's your character like? Are you a culture fit? I can teach you. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm hiring a CFO, I, I kind of got to look at that resume a little bit. But for most of our opportunities, our careers, I'm looking for skills, uh, 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 character fit, 
and can we teach the skill? That's it. Our average salary is about $77,000 a year. I've never looked at one resume. And I'll share the story with you. The reason why is because Mrs. Porter, my teacher in school, she never judged me. She never opened my folder to see how many times I had been in juvenile. Juvenile prison, three times. She never opened it, so she never judged me. And that's where I came from. So for me, I don't want to judge the person. And, and it seems to be working out okay. We, we were the, the number one company culture in America by Entrepreneur Magazine. We've won number one here in Austin, number two in Texas. Can't figure out why we can't get number one in Texas, but well, different, different story. So why I share that with you is like I said, same person, but I gave you two different resumes. Two people would have interviewed the guy that can only read on the fifth and sixth grade level. That's still today. I struggle reading my kids' books. That's still today. Everyone wanted to interview the guy that scaled the companies. You do this on, on a whole different level. So I know a lot of people out here are thinking about the, the risk, the factors. Oh, we, we, we can't do that. We're, we're a professional organization. Go into, go into details about some of the risk. Well, yeah, so I, um, I'm a small businessman, um, and quite often, like my other, when I got involved with Grayston in this open hiring process, quite a few of my friends owned companies, and they literally thought I was crazy. I mean, they, like, you're running a, you know, um, you know, a cleaning company, it's, you know, background checks, drug tests, it's so critical, and I, we do all that. We're, we're very, you know, you know, high-level cleaning company, but uh, I've been involved in the, uh, in the community for so long, and you get to know these people, and there's so many stories behind, as um, these guys have mentioned, the stories that when you get to know the folks, the, the, uh, what you can do to help people with this process is unbelievable. So we don't have open hiring like Grayston does where every single person, um, we just have a list. We have a very active... HR department, about five people, but we have a, a, um, a number of people in our business, like right now it's between 40 and 50, where we engage the customers. So I have great customers that want to contribute and want to do this, so it's an interactive thing with the community, and um, it's, I've been a practitioner for maybe eight years now, nine years, um, with, with Grayston's help, and it's unbelievable how the community now is, is rallying behind it, and the risk, I really believe there's no more risk. My insurance hasn't changed. My, my t you know, the things that all CEOs worry about. We all worried about risk, but I, it, it's, it's quite the opposite. Like the, the impact we're having on the Rochester community is unbelievable, and it's it's taken time. But because the first time you hear it, you're like, I, well, that's it's a nice idea, but I, I have to take care of my stakeholders. I, I you know, but I believe it's a it's a human resource tool that can really change the world, especially if everyone does a little bit, like. I have 600 plus folks right now, but I'm using 40 or 50 in the open hiring model. That's if everybody here did a little bit, and we can more than meet uh, Joe's goals. So, so, so keep 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 going there. Tell tell us a story uh, that you told me last night. The the one individual. What was it? What was his name? Sanford. 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 Yes. I have a great story. It was way before I knew anything about Grayston or open hiring. It was um, 1996. Um, I was early on in my business career, like five years in or something, so I uh, um, were cleaning buildings, so it's like late night, and I see this, one of my buildings is all lit up, and it's, it's I think it was one, two in the morning, <clears throat> so I, I, I go over there, and there's a, a gentleman sitting in there, Sanford, I'm like, Sanford, what are you doing? He's like, well, no one showed up tonight, so I have to clean the whole building myself. It was like a 70,000 square foot building, it's the middle of the night. I was like, oh my gosh, Sanford, so let me help you out. So we started cleaning and talking, and then I, um, he's, he's cleaning, and I see something on his ankle. I'm like, Sanford, what's that on your ankle? And he's like, well, Ty, uh, I'm, a, I'm an ex-con. I'm a felon. I'm like, how did you get into the company? You know, like, how did you, you know, our <laughs> HR department? He goes, well, they didn't catch me. I don't know. I just, I got the job, and he's been there for six months. He's, uh, you know, good hard worker. He's sitting there in the middle of the night working, and I'm like, what in the world do I do, you know, because my, my, you know, 
I don't know that many. I mean, he was literally out of prison for like a month or two, you know, and he was long, <laughs> a pretty rough guy, you know. Um, but at that moment, I'm, this guy's in the middle of the night cleaning the building with me, so I said, he begged me, he said, Ty, please, I, I, I can do a great job for you. So um, I said, sure, why not? You know, let's just, you know, it was something was just interesting to meet a guy like this. And the uh, end of the story, I'll jump to 25 years later, probably the most impactful person I've ever met in my life. He, uh, he ended up managing about 150 people, made 75K. He's a leader, emotional intelligence beyond belief, um, and, and probably one of my dearest friends. So um, I talked to these guys last night a little bit, but what happens if my HR, HR department did that? I never would have met him. Totally changed my company. So my you know, aha moment when I got to know Grayson a little bit is like, how many Sanfords are there that are sitting right here in Austin or right in Rochester, all your hometowns, that can change your company? There's thousands of, of Sanfords sitting there. And I, I keep looking for the next Sanford. And, and I've blessed to find hundreds of them over the last 20 plus years. Um, and Grayston uh, gives the, the best practices so you know, CEOs that want to do this, but they do it with, with you know, um, strategy and vigor. It's not just a haphazard thing. This is a, it's an HR strategy that works. And I, that's, that's where I am with in, in, the, uh, in the progression. I, I believe we're, this is a, Grayston is, it's, it's a, I'm a hard, very hard worker. This is what the world needs, is what Grayston's offering. So that's, that's why I'm up here. Thank you, sir. And can I just add to that? Because the one thing I would add is that, you know, this, again, is not some kind of a social work type policy that we have. I mean, it is truly a strategy. It is truly, you know, this is how you need to manage human capital. The one thing that we get rid of is just the barrier to entry. We don't get rid of standards. We don't get rid of accountability. You, know, you have to do a good job. You got to adhere to good manufacturing practices. You got to show up. And if not, you know, we don't judge you on the way in and we won't judge you on the way out. Uh, so we're servicing Ben and Jerry's Unilever, Whole Foods. These are marquee customers. So we have to adhere to a very high level of standards and quality. So it is just how we bring folks in. But everything else is normal. <laughs> dive, dive back into when you were talking about the uh, the poverty levels and the the, yeah. the income levels for for people because let, let, let's be honest so so many of us in this room are, are so far removed from uh poverty and the what the the dollar amounts that mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about i mean it was just what three five years ago we were arguing about in this country raising the minimum wage to ten dollars an hour if you do the math on that, $10 an hour, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that's 20800 before taxes. Come on. How much did we all pay to come to this conference? So to, to dive into that. Yeah, and I'll dive into the, in, in this sense, because as the part of the strategy and looking at this from a human capital standpoint is, Folks are coming from these backgrounds and every story is different. So you have to look at folks on an individual basis. We've had situations where folks were sleeping in their car. I've had situations where folks were dealing with substance issues, domestic violence. So the way we address all of that or are about to get evicted, we have a social worker that sits in house to address all of those challenges for us. And this is why I call it the next evolution of human resources, because that's how we have to start thinking about things. If we really want to bring people off the fringes and into the workplace, we have to start thinking about benefits differently. We have to start thinking about, you know, what do my employees need? I mean, if anything this last year and a half has taught us is people feeling safe. Do they feel there's a career path for them? Do they feel there is a future here? Or bottom line, does my company care? I mean, that's really inclusive employment. So addressing all of those issues in, in, in the community, because again, 80, 60 to 80% of our bakers are from Yonkers. So they're in that number and mm -hmm. they're struggling with all of those issues. It, is, it behooves me as an organization and us as an organization to figure out how do we address those things and get folks employed, because it's win-win. If I help you deal with your issue, whether it's eviction or whatever it might be, you show up for work and you can bring your full self to work because the issues are being addressed. And guess what? We get brownies out the door. Ben and Jerry's, our customers, they're taken care of. Your family life is good. I'm good. It, win, win, win. It's, um, 
We all know we just came off the virus. We're here, hospitality. And Joseph and I were talking about this. And I said, if everyone in this room, Joseph mentioned it earlier and it really, really hit for, for me. Most of us in this room have spent $250 on a business dinner, business lunch. But, but come on, we, we all have. We leave a 20% tip, $50. I have an ask, and you can tell me to go to hell, it's fine. But I, I have an ask. How many of you are, are staying here at the hotel? Almost everyone, right? Okay. Big, big favor to ask. We'll leave a $50 tip for a business lunch. Can you all leave $5 for housekeeping? $5. Think about this. We'll leave $50 for the person who brings out our food. They took our order. Most times, if you're at a $250 restaurant, that's not the person bringing out the food. They just took your order. Someone else is bringing out the food. They're just directing, put it there, put it there. But we leave $50. We don't leave $5 for the people that clean the toilets that we sit on, the beds that we sleep in, and God knows what else happens in those rooms. <laughs> we don't... <laughs> hey, I'm just trying to start with $5. And, and, and the reason why I say that is $5 could change someone's life in here. Five dollars might be a gallon of gas that's going to get that person home this evening or bring them back to work the next day or take their child to get an ice cream cone. And the irony that we'll leave fifty dollars at a high-end restaurant for a tip, but we won't leave five dollars for the people that clean the toilets we sit on. So my, my ask is just leave five dollars. You want to get real creative, Take a picture of it, leave them a note, say thank you, and email the picture of the money that you left to Alexander so he can put it on, on the screen. We can change the whole economic standpoint of this hotel in, in one day if all of us leave $5. Housekeeping is going to wonder what the hell's going on. <laughs> Let me, uh, maybe I can take something with that because you said little things make a difference. Um, Something else Grayston's taught me and that I've done, he mentioned a social worker, um, little things that the entry level folks are fighting. You just, you cannot believe the, uh, the barriers, even if they have the job now, and what, you know, how can they, how can you keep them there? Um, with, uh, we actually have a Grayston um, person that comes into our office a couple times a week and he does a thing called path making. And it's, it was really supposed to be for the open hiring folks, but my other, you know, hundreds of entry level people have flocked to this model because you look at the whole person, like, yes. you know, they don't have a car, they don't, they eat poorly, their kids are struggling at school, um, you know, half of them don't have a license. There's the things that you can't imagine, the barriers. And you start opening these barriers up, and that's really what Grace Dinn has said. Um, you have people that are connected for life, they can't believe. They haven't had a license or they've owed something for 20 years and you just dig into it and solve it. It's, I mean, little thing for you, it was a $500 fine. It seemed like nothing from a ticket 20 years ago. And all of a sudden they can't believe they now, you know, like, so you mentioned it, little things. Um, I think five's too little. I think 20 is good for janitors uh, on the tips. But uh, I think little things that one, little, one person at a time makes a huge difference. So Joseph, Joseph's going to close out on what, what he wants us all, all to do, and, and I'll, I'll share this last piece with you. What Joseph's leading the charge on and the work that he's doing, it's the society that we live in right now. Regardless if you're a religious person or not, I'm a God guy, I'm a, a man of faith. If we all lived by just this commandment, regardless if you believe in God or not, it said, love thy neighbor. Regardless of where we live, these folks are still our neighbors. And they said, love thy neighbor, and it didn't put stipulations on there. It didn't say, love thy neighbor, but not if they're gay. It didn't say, love thy neighbor, but not if they're mixed race, not if they're poor, not if they're a single mom with five kids. It said, love thy neighbor, period. These are our neighbors. I live in a gated community now, but I once lived in low economic poverty. I lived in public housing. 
I watched my mom get evicted and called a nigger lover because she had a mixed race child. Love thy neighbor. If we just started there, we'd solve 90% of the shit that's going on in our country. That's it, I'm done. I would, <laughs> I would, I, I'll, I'll just say this. Last year, March 16th, when New York was shut down because of COVID, our industry, food manufacturing, was deemed essential. So we actually have not stopped running since COVID started. We were operating at almost seven days a week. Everybody came to work. And we didn't lose one person until this year, actually, to COVID. That is the dedication of the people that come through inclusive, open hiring. They're dedicated. They want to be successful. And it is an amazing how, as we look at that brick wall and we think of all these different barriers, that we see these people as unemployable. They were now deemed essential. So the challenge for this group, who's going to be your essential worker? Front desk person, somebody in your manufacturing facility, your landscaper, your maintenance person. I don't know who it might be. We could talk about it. But who's going to be your next essential worker? And that's how we change this economy. That's how we get things going again. What, all, what can we all do right now when we leave here? Grayston.org. <laughs> and call us. I'll be here. So we're ready to talk and we're ready to change things. So it's, it's now or never. Excellent. Thank you all. Good job. Okay. My man.